On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to have back with us Dr. Sherry Cho. She's an associate professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine, Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She's also the director of the Global Consortium to Study Neurological Dysfunction in COVID-19 or GCS NeuroCOVID-19, which is endorsed by the Neurocritical Care Society. And uh, you're back with us today on, on this video series and you're you're, you're ranked number two in terms of the most watched uh, of, of all videos that we've done. Um, so the content, the topic, um, you got to outdo Sanjay Gupta on this one, Sherry. Let's see if we can do it. That, that's quite a challenge. Oh, dear. <laughs> Big shoes to fill. But honestly, uh, be, be, based on the, the progress that you guys have had, we've talked you know, just around five months or so ago when, when the idea was, was, was emerging, you I think you had like 40 sites now, and now I think you're somewhere up to over 200 sites, and then you just partnered with the European. I, I mean, just, just tell me about what's happening. So much has been done, several publications, more to come. How are things going? Thank you for that. Um, things, are, things are really moving forward, and I, I, I just have to say, you know, I'm as surprised as you are, and we're so thankful and just so excited by all the enthusiasm and all the support we have from colleagues all around the world. Um, so when we first spoke um, way back, I think that was about, we were at about 50 sites. And, and we, got, we went from zero to 50 in about a week, which was um, a shock. And we were getting ready to say, well, good, we're going to run a 50 site consortium. Let's buckle up and you know, do good work and don't let people down. And then the numbers just kept going up. Then we opened a pediatrics arm and our pediatrics PIs, you know, I want to give a shout out to them. They have a lot of experience with international collaboration. So they immediately got through a network. So currently, I think the, at the last count, we have 212. Um, wait, let me, re, let, me, let me retract. We have 112 adult sites and 96 pediatric wow. sites um, within the GCS NeuroCOVID consortium itself. And... Currently, we, we still do cover all continents except for Antarctica. Um, as far as I know, we don't have, we don't have colleagues in Antarctica. Um, and, and we're very excited that we have a formal collaborative um, agreement with the European Academy of Neurology. They have also built an incredible network. Um, they've launched their own NeuroCOVID surveillance study called Codename Energy. And the energy network, I think, is at about 240 sites. Um, and their reach is, you know, all over the world as well, but with the majority, as we can imagine, in Europe and North Africa. And so when we put their uh, reach together with ours, it's almost completely complementary. And, you know, we share the same mission. We share the same ideas. Um, independently, when we compared our case report forms and our data elements, we have over 80% direct overlap, which was very reassuring to think that two groups of people across different sides of the Atlantic, when we sat down and said, hey, what's, what is most important that we really need to collect right now about neurological manifestations of COVID, spontaneously, the stuff that we came up with had over 80% overlap. Um, we've had a great collaboration um, right now, bringing both of these networks together the entire network is approximately 450 sites. The numbers shift up and down every week a little bit. Um, and I should also mention that we're very, very excited that the Latin American Brain Injury Consortium and the Possible Network, which is also in Latin America, have also formally partnered with us. So, um, so we're, we're very, very excited um, by all the support and all the partners. And we've translated our study forms and our data forms and our data def definitions into Spanish and Portuguese uh, for both adults and pediatrics, and hopefully, hopefully more to come. Great. Well, that is um, that's honestly tremendous. I mean, uh, it seems honestly like a lifetime ago that we last spoke with everything that's happened in the world, but um, the progress you guys have made, the international uh, collaboration, um, translating into different languages, um, and honestly, the, the publications. I I saw one of the publications uh, in the Neurocritical Care uh, Journal, Neurocritical Care Society Journal. Um, that really announced the consortium, went into detail, and, and talked about the study design and rationale. And that was a really, really terrific paper. Um, I guess you know, one thing, 
how, how are you doing through all this? Um, you know, us uh, with with our folks with boots on the ground. Um, you know, you're not just you know leading in you know this this gigantic consortium. Um, you know, we're trying to get a six site consortium for Alzheimer's prevention off the ground, and that's enough headaches you guys have. I don't even know how, but you're also, you just got off 14 days in the ICU. Um, how are you holding up uh, with, with managing all this stuff? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think, um, you know, at, during this pandemic, I guess we're, we, we have all this sense of we're just sort of hanging on. And like you, I, I can't remember when this pandemic started. It feels like it started about a thousand years ago. And, um, and you know, I, I'm very, very grateful to I work with a great group of people, both in the consortium and right here, you know, among my own colleagues. So um, even though, you know, they're, you know, let's be honest, this is a tough pandemic for everybody. Um, and there, and there are definitely tough times. We all miss things that we hold dear prior to, to the onset of this pandemic. And, um, and I'm just so grateful that I work with such a great group of people so we can support each other through the difficult times. Um, I personally, I, I, before 2020, I thought, I thought I was working too much and I better work on, you know, reducing my plate and, and, you know, managing my stress, all of those things. And then, and then the pandemic hit and I think my workload just doubled. Um, and, um, and we talked a little bit about this, you know, my, my encephalopathy sets in and by the end of the 14 days, I'm speaking neologisms to my colleagues, but fortunately they all understand me and we, we carry yeah. on. Um, yeah. But it's an incredible time in our history, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, I appreciate you uh, not just having your boots on the ground, but having your tentacles uh, out there otherwise. Uh, you know, we need this because, um, you know, I remember when we first spoke, I was trying to um, kind of goad you a little bit into saying, okay, well, well, well what have you learned? Well, what are the results? And, and I, I'm, I have now learned I'm actually not going to push you today and say, okay, well, well, where are the results? I know that they're, you know, probably a couple months away. You know, I know, you know, the papers are probably being written. The sites are still, you're still getting the data in. You need to analyze the data, hopefully in the next month, whenever it is. But I guess what I've seen over the last several months is when, um, uh, uh, either whether it's, whether it's a treatment or it's um, uh, a finding, whatever it is in medical science, and things are um, pushed forward a little bit too quickly or even a lot too quickly, um, you know, it, it can it can have a really profound potential negative impact. You know, for example, if a drug is is touted as being you know the be all and end all, and then it's not, um, well, then maybe people that got that drug were harmed by that drug. So, so, so the, this is a little bit different, but I think it's important that you guys are um, taking a very metered approach. Um, you know, there's this saying, publish or perish. You guys have been publishing, which is great, but you're, you're really making this registry and, and this consortium rigorous, um, really fine-tuned, so that when these papers come out in whatever high-tier high journals they come out in, um, I think the global community will believe them and, and also implement in everyday practice um, some of the findings. Um, what is your publication plan or what are your plans for kind of um, getting results out there in the future? Thank you for that. Thank you for that important comment and an important question. And I would, you know, I would just first say that, you know, as a, as a physician scientist, I do feel torn because the physician side in me, I want a result three months ago, because we needed to know what to do with our patients who are coming in every day with questions. And the scientists in me, we're, we're so concerned about partial information because time and time again, we've seen the effect of that. It, it, it may, when we capture partial information, we may get misled down to another rabbit hole in the worst case scenario. But even in the best case scenario, what it means is when we lose, um, when we lose that equipoise, we basically, we get to the point where we're not able to do trials anymore because people don't believe in the neutrality of what we're testing and they favor a certain intervention or a test without sufficient data. And that would then lead to a situation where we would never get that data possibly for decades and carry on. And, and all of this have huge public health implications. So our approach on the global consortium on this is multifold. We recognize that whatever we do needs to be fast without sacrificing rigor. So the, the challenge and, and the, that onus is on us 
to be able to design trials that are robust enough that can be run in a short period of time and deliver that piece of results and then, and then move on and, and, and do the next piece. And, and we talked a little bit in our first meeting about um, a tiered design, and that is exactly you know, what we hope will help us do that. <clears throat> so we, we thought what we would do is run short tiers of studies, each study with a very clear deliverable. Um, we're not going to you know, find the answer to the origin of the universe in one study, but we want, we want to be able to incrementally go forward Meanwhile, understanding that during the short durations of study, maybe three to four months per, per each study, um, a lot of information would change. We're learning so much about COVID in real time that by the end of three to four months, we need to revamp our study design. We need to revamp our data elements. We may have to rethink some of the concepts. And the tiered study allows us to do that, it allows us to um, have opportunities to adjust to the new information, the new reality of time and keep going. I'll be honest with you, I was very much hoping that by the end of our first tier study, um, which is, cl we're close to the end of first tier now, I was hoping that we would be done with COVID and we wouldn't have a second wave and, and, and the, you know, the consortium may not need to do a second tier and that would be wonderful for the, for the world. Um, it looks like we will definitely be doing our tier two, tier three, um, and beyond, um, but, but that's great because we've learned so much in the last three months and we are um, actively designing and finalizing our tier two um, design. I'm very excited to say that in doing so, we have the opportunity to collaborate and work with so many other big consortium, big groups out there who may be studying similar things that overlap or who might be studying general COVID, who may be in a different area that we're not capturing but we're actively harmonizing and standardizing our data elements and our data definitions and our study protocols. So that, that way in the future, when all of these big consortia finish collecting our data, we would have done the hard work a priori where we standardize our methodology in the beginning. So at the end, we can then merge our data and do a high quality meta-analysis where there's not so much heterogeneity in the data elements themselves to make the data uninterpretable. And so we're, we have, you know, partners in Europe, partners in the UK, multiple partners in the United States and Canada and Latin America, uh, where we're literally actively harmonizing all of our data elements. We're also partnering with the gen groups that work on general COVID studies, um, collecting general COVID data elements. And uh, we're partnering with them to make sure that the general COVID data we collect as part of our neuro study uh, is harmonized with all the other big network trials and that and where they need neurological input and neurological data elements and endpoints um, we would provide that and you know one of the things that has gotten some traction that the general covid trials are are looking into are you know the incidences of stroke um, and the instances of encephalopathy and you know delirium is always a big topic for a lot of people outside the neurology community and it's really nice to now have that dialogue between um, neurological experts and, and experts who are doing sort of general COVID studies in the, in the population. Yeah, actually right along those lines, I, I remember one of your papers, um, I think it was like neurological complications of COVID-19 infection. And there was this really beautifully um, designed di uh, figure uh, and there was kind of like what you were saying, there was on, on the one side, there was uh, the non-immunological, uh, you know, putative mechanisms of, of, uh, of of neuro neurological consequences, and there was the immunological. And, you know, understanding why a person could have some encephalopathy, why they could have some delirium. Is it hypotension, hypoxia, micro and macrovascular thrombosis on the non-immunological side, or is it on the immunological side, adaptive autoimmunity, microglial activation, maladaptive cytokine profiles? You know, these, these, um, these aspects are going to be so critical in understanding how we treat patients. Um, how have you, maybe in in the in, in your in your work, um, tried to get down to the nitty gritty to try to understand some of these mechanisms, and then you know how can we potentially use this understanding to to guide therapies? Do you think um, you'll be able to make some progress in that area too? Um, that's a great question, and we we absolutely hope so. And just as you said so nicely, I think. When we think about the neurological manifestations of a systemic disease, 
which which is COVID nineteen. Um, it's not. It's not. We're not seeing the kind of thing that we like to see as neurologists. A clean, yeah. you know, neurological diagnosis that only affects the nervous system, and we can forget about the rest of the body. And I was saying in my, my work as a neurointensivist, the world that that is not the reality. The reality is that the entire body is attached. And um, even though as a neurologist, I still think the nervous system is the most important organ in the entire body. It, is, it, it needs to be supported by a healthy cardiovascular system. It needs oxygen, so you need a healthy pulmonary system. And in the end of the day, all of these play into your neurological health. And often when we see neurological sequelae, not just COVID-19, but any general diseases we see in really, really sick people, it's not Occam's razor. It's not as clean as we like it. And in a you know, recent interview I did uh, with uh, Sanjay Gupta, he, he, you know, he sort of challenged me on that. And I, you know, I said, you know, that that's the thing. In, in critical illness, life is messy and critical illness is messy. And we have, we have the primary neurological effects of COVID-19, of which there may be many. We still don't know for a fact that the virus doesn't really enter into the central nervous system. No one has been able to PCR it out of CSF. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. We may have just not been able to get it. There is certainly the potential immunological or the para-infectious neuroimmune uh, mechanism that we're very interested in looking at. And, but there's a whole slew of other things, the systemic implications of, the implications of systemic disease. So in a very hypoxic patient, you can get hypoxic brain injury, people who are who are prothrombotic could potentially get a stroke, but also the things we're doing to these patients to treat their severe lung disease, the patients who are paralyzed and sedated for a prolonged period of time on high modes of ventilation are certainly at risk for critical illness associated in neuropathy and myopathy and delirium. Um, patients who are getting anticoagulants for their thrombotic complications could be brain bleeding into their central nervous system and then, you know, we have a whole slew of patients who have chronic neurological diseases. And we know that when those patients get sick, whether it's from COVID-19 or influenza or something else, it can bring about a recurrence or at least a temporary worsening of their existing symptoms. And, um, and we're seeing that as well. So in this consortium, we hope to pay attention to all of these things and collect the relevant data points so we can tease out at least in what, which one of these major categories do the symptoms fall as a first step? And then as we develop the tier two and tier three, we hope to collect more and more granular and detailed data. And finally, in our tier three, which is our experimental and translational arm of our study, we hope we will be able to use um, advanced neuroimaging techniques, neurophysiologic techniques, um, molecular biology techniques and biomarkers that will then get us closer to the mechanism of injury and a pathophysiology. And from there, we can talk about potential therapeutics. That's great. Yeah, I, I, this, this virus in some ways is like a chameleon. Like it can affect so many people in so many different ways and understanding exactly why and how um, honestly is the only way we're gonna be able to effectively treat it. Um, I think I'm, I may be, hopefully I'm paraphrasing correctly, but Dr. Fauci had an interview and said he's never seen another pathogen that's had such differential effects on different people, um, you know, and, and, you know, we have, you know, I'm an Alzheimer's specialist, right? So, you know, there's absolutely sex differences in Alzheimer's. We've, you know, finding that with, with COVID-19 um, there's, you know, from GI disturbance to loss of smell. I mean, from every angle there, there's, there's the issue and, you know, how to predict um, which patients are going to be affected most. Is it through the pre presenting symptoms? Is it through, I saw a study, um, on the 23andMe uh, news, news, uh, whatever it it said about you know different blood group antigen, like the different blood types can can affect. Um, also in, in my area again, Alzheimer's. Um, people with two copies of the ApoE4 uh, variant, the two E4 ApoE4 fours, those people are more severely affected, and that's a whole interesting topic of discussion for why and how. So I think you know putting all of this together and really getting down into the into the deep. Is this a precision medicine question? Is this uh, something something even more basic? Is it something more complicated with the with the immunological versus non-immunological mechanisms? Um, you have a lot of work to do. Have fun with that. You know, in many as a scientist, this this is a fascinating disease because of just the number of 
differential manifestations. We've seen the number of people involved and the duration of the symptoms. We, we talked a little bit about that too. And some people, even people who have recovered um, from the virus can have symptoms that are long lasting. And dare I say, we haven't, we have not yet, we haven't had enough time yet to see um, if there's a phase two uh, in the recovered patients. I, I absolutely, I, I sure hope not. Um, but we should be ready to capture that phenomenon if it exists. Um, and, and so as a scientist, this is fascinating. And I think we're going to learn a lot about not just COVID-19, but I think human biology. And as you said, um, probably take us to the next level of precision medicine, of understanding how different, how different people may react so differently to presumably the same, almost the same pathogen. The virus itself does mutate some as well. As a physician, though, and as a potential patient, because we're all at risk for catching this, um, it, it's a scary thought. Um, yeah. Don't know what to expect. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you more on that one. Yep. I. Uh, you know, I, I was. I was in New York. I'm still in New York. Um, my brother's mother-in-law was uh, in the ICU, intubated for 37 days. Uh, finally discharged. Just got out of rehab. She was admitted the second week of March. Got out home at the end of. Um, August. I mean, these, these, what, what is, you know, great. You, we got, we, a, a miracle saved, saved her life through amazing physicians, through amazing care. But what, what next, what's happening next? And then even the people that weren't critically ill, people that stayed home, but they're still coughing five, six months later. Well, why, why are they coughing? Chest x-rays normal. Uh, wait a minute. The CT of the lungs are normal. PFTs are normal. What's happening? These are real symptoms, right? And then with the neurological manifestations, wow, like how we have even less tools, um, you know, brain imaging, okay, um, spinal fluid tests, not, haven't gotten too many of those. Really understanding this with, with limited tools, also with limited testing, not, not even everyone that we pretty much believe had it was able to get a test months and months and months ago. So what do you do there, whether it's in a registry or, or whatever else? So um, lots of challenging questions, but honestly, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty excited. I mean, with, with, with over 400 sites, um, with the papers that have come out and the real, you know, real, the scientific method is, is being followed really rigorously. And hopefully you guys get uh, a fair amount of funding for this because um, this isn't easy. I'm sure you're putting in a lot of time and I think you hopefully can, you know, get, get additional funding and hire some help. Um, you know, this is going to be a, a long-term study. I mean, I, I think, I agree with you. What, what are the, okay, now we know what the six month manifestations are. You know, the term that I've heard used is the COVID long haulers. Uh, there's a Facebook group with over 10,000 people that I've been actually, um, you know, checking in on fairly, fairly frequently, learning some interesting stuff. Other stuff is a little bit confusing. Don't know what to make of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a healthy skepticism, but, you know, Possibly, probably something real here with some symptoms that really in my head don't make any sense, but they probably exist because so many people are talking about them. But how do you prove this? How do you figure this out? And then it's not just the six months, but the one year, the two year. Um, what are your long term plans for this? Um, what, what, you know, in terms of maybe grants you're submitting or in terms of, you know, plans for the consortium, um, are you looking to do this for a year or two years longer than that? Or is it just kind of take it one step at a time? Um, I think. What is clear is we, we know we have our work cut out for us. The need is absolutely there. And, you know, after our last interview, after we published our first couple of papers, we've been hearing from so many people. We've had an incredible response from, you know, people who just write in to, to me and to my co-investigators. I've been hearing from some of our own colleagues who have had COVID and um, reporting their own symptoms of just the incredible brain fog for lack of better term. And I'm not able to, I'm not their physician. I'm not able to characterize it further at this moment, except to build it into our next steps in our consortium. Um, we certainly have a lot of work to do. We know that in the short term, we hope to um, carry out this interim analysis. We're currently gathering data for that. And that would hope, hopefully at least answer some of the very basic questions we set out to do at the beginning of the consortium. And we're actively putting in grant applications and also forming and collaborating with other big consortia to move forward with our tier two and tier three studies as we have planned. So we can begin to describe finer, to a finer detail, what are these clinical phenotypes? What may be their imaging findings, EEG findings? Can we even pick anything up? 
from our routine diagnostics. And if the answer is either yes or no, phase three, uh, tier three will follow that with some experimental protocols to see if we can pick them up with a more refined technique. And I think long-term, um, we definitely would hope to tackle and further understand the people who are still symptomatic after recovering. Um, being sort of acute care physicians and intensivists, we also do hope that we can partner with some of the general COVID trials so that we can look at the therapeutics that are being tested and whether there is a neurospecific response profile. Um, is there something that specifically benefit or is detrimental to patients with neurological deficits? Or just, you know, yesterday I had a question from a dear friend who says, what is the mortality of an intubated patient who also have neurological symptoms in COVID-19? We can all probably guess it's probably not good based on other critical illnesses, but we actually don't have the numbers. And as an intensivist, I can't help to ask the questions. Well, if the numbers are not good, how do we make it good? Because there's got to be a way. And so I think our longer term goals are there. We do need to find more and more resources um, to support these scientific endeavors. And as investigators, that, that, would be, you know, that would be our charge too, is to, while we push forward the science, we um, reach out to the appropriate funding agencies to find um, a long-term funding strategy for this, um, for, this, for this concept and this structure that we've set up. And, and I would also say that some of the things we talk about is because we, we sort of launch this, in a, we, it's an emergency launch, of a neurological network in a, in, in a, in a pandemic, um, we learned a lot of lessons in doing so, and it's sort of a new experience. We, don't, we didn't really have any blueprints to follow, and we hope what we did here will be a blueprint, but if in the future we have another pandemic, that's not COVID-19, but that very reasonably might involve the nervous system, we have the structure there already, we have the know-how, and we save and generate tools and save the knowledge that we learn from this process so that the next time we can just rapidly deploy, go out there, do things even faster than we did this time around, and hopefully defeat the pandemic faster than we're doing right now with this one. That would be nice. I agree. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, well, Sherry, I look forward to having you back for a third time because that's, that's the results. That's the, that's the most fun. Well, all of it is fun and hard, and I don't even know what, but uh, I'm looking forward to our third chat, but our second chat uh, was awesome. Sherry, thanks so much for your time. Go get some rest. You've been on for 14 days. Stop with all these balls and videos and whatnot. Go take a vacation. You can't really go anywhere from vacation, so I don't even, I don't know. I'm not even sure what to tell you. Yeah. REM sleep would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The REM sleep vacation. You heard it here first. I'm going to, I need some of that too. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Of course. Stay in touch. Take care. Sure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.